सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली Now all of us are familiar with something that Victor Hugo said nobody can stop an idea whose time has come now idea can be good idea can be bad so if you look at good and bad ideas we apply a little bit of our cynical spin or maybe maybe the spin of reality or a reality check based on our politics so what is my spin one yes nobody can stop a good idea whose time has come but if it's a good idea that a political leadership elected leadership has implemented chances are that it will lose the next election and second nobody can at the same time also stop a bad idea whose time has come and when a bad idea comes somebody will make it worse somebody will make it worse in the course of time and yet when yet another reformist person decides gathers the courage to bury that idea and with come up with something new and better somebody in the course of time again will come up to pull it out of the grave and again revive it so let me put a full spin on victor hugo and said nobody can stop a bad dead and buried bad idea from being exhumed if it suits the purpose of the politics of the day that is the entire new pension scheme old pension sp- scheme debate that's going on right now now this is cut into the uh, ravdi ravdi culture debate so 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 it gets all cluttered and confusing but pension scheme is something very specific now in 2003 mr vajpayee's government came up with the idea they figured they figured that india's pension burden was becoming too high and too many countries across the world had gone bankrupt trying to service old pensions it's a populist thing to do so he came up with a modern idea of new pension scheme so this was not a defined benefit scheme this this was a contributory scheme so under the old pension scheme you knew that on the day you retired you got 50% of your salary of your last salary drawn plus other benefits plus as dearness allowances kept going up you got your benefit so you knew how much you were going to get in the new scheme you contributed 10% from your salary that was your contribution that's why it's contrib- contributory deposit the government matched it the government added another 10% now the government has made it 14% to make it more attractive so government share has become 14% that then was given to a trust which invested this and within that trust you can now choose your fund manager to it there's a there's a panel of fund managers to see who will who you think will do best and there are norms and then this money keeps growing and as you retire you can withdraw 60% of it of the corpus if you so wish another 40% has to go into an annuity what's an annuity it goes into a kind of a deposit with any of the impanel uh, funds which gives which gives you interest your yearly basis like a pension so you get lump sum and then you get a pension what happens in this case is that you are contributing now and government is contributing now as well so nothing is being left for the future so when a person retires that person's money is already in this corpus earning interest or whatever other growth whether whether part of it is an equity or 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 whatever so once again this is not a liability to be paid by our future generations but old pension schemes or ops as it's called under that all liabilities are paid by our future generations so i will try and explain this to you this is quite complicated and i am helped a great deal here and i'm relying greatly on this report done by state bank of india's economists headed by swami kanti ghosh and it's a wonderful report i will share a link with you it's called eco rap it's one of their their periodic reports and they tell you if you now start shifting this idea of shifting to old pension scheme they say is a route to fiscal harakiri they say we should not commit fiscal harakiri in the quest of populism 
So to try and understand this better, we first have to figure out a few acronyms that will feature again, again and again. So you know OPS and NPS. OPS is old pension scheme, NPS is new pension scheme. And I told you the difference between the two. The other is PAYG or P-A-Y-G, that is pay as you go. So PAYG was the old pension scheme, which is pay as you go when an employer retires. You take from whatever revenues you have for this year of the budget, you pay the person, you start paying the person. So every year your pension bill go, keeps on going up. You are not making any provision for any pensions, right? So in, the, in, in that sense, every year your budget is paying for more pensions. So that is pay as you go. Third thing that we must, must understand is implicit public pension debt. So what is implicit public pension debt? That is if you go back to the old pension scheme, that means you then have to calculate what will my pension budget be 10 years from now because you are not providing for it right now. Under new pension scheme, you are taking 10% from the employee, you are putting 14%, that is then growing. Uh, so that you already put away. But in the, in the old pension scheme, you have to then make a calculation. It's a, it's a very complex calculation. You have to see how many employees you have, the number of employees, how many will retire, when, what will be their aging analysis, what's been the entry age of workers. So let's say, let's, let's presume that the entry age of workers in the government is at 28 years. Then expected lifespans, which keep changing. In fact, fortunately, they keep, in, they keep improving all the time. Uh, then the size of average benefit, which is in the old pension scheme, 50% of the last pay. Retirement age and discount. Now, you know why governments are under pressure to try and increase retirement age? Because they think that, look, the moment the employee retires, the employee is doing nothing, but I will have to start paying pension. So let me get more work on a salary for two years. Let, let me delay the pension burden for as long as possible. So retirement age and also a discounting. Discounting means you have to take out net present value. So you don't have to be a chartered accountant to understand that. So what will be worth 10,000 rupees 20 years from now? What is that worth today? Right. So you do a, do a net present value accounting. So that is the implicit public pension debt. So if you look at implicit public pension debt, Right now, that will be by 2036, if everybody goes back to the old pension scheme, will be humongous. So, will be humongous. So, if you read what Arvind Panagadia is saying, Arvind Panagadia has been interviewed by the Indian Express, you can see that, that article, and he says that, see what happened to Brazil, that in Brazil, almost 12 to 13 percent of their GDP is now being used up in paying pensions. Look at India. In India, tax to GDP ratio is only 16%, which means if you go on this route, are you going to give away, like Brazil, 12 to 13% or maybe more or maybe a little bit less of your total tax revenues to your ex-employees, retired employees? And then you might say that, oh, it's a good idea. This is like a universal uh, basic income, but it's not a universal basic in income because very few, a very small percentage of our population is in government employment. So what that does is that an employed elite, which is government employees, then take away a humongous part of the national kitty at the expense of others. Now, if you look at Rajasthan, for example, so again, there is an article by Rajiv Maheshi our former finance secretary and our former CAG, who happens to be from Rajasthan cadre, Rajiv Maharshi and Renuka Sane, an economist who write for the print also, who say that, look, in Rajasthan, there are 10 lakh families of government employees. This is 10 lakhs out of 1.6 crores of total families in Rajasthan, which means this is 6% of all of Rajasthan's families depend on the government, work for the government, either take a salary from the government or take a pension from the government. Rajasthan government's current salary bill is 60,300 crores. Its current pension bill already is 23,000 crores. So that comes to 83,300 crores for a medium-sized state. Rajasthan is not a small state. This comes to, this 83,000 crores, 83,300 crores comes to 56%. 56% of all of the state's own tax and non-tax revenues. State's own revenues. This is not inclusive of revenues that the, or the revenue share that the state might get from the center, whether by way of grants or by way of GST, etc. This is the state's own revenues. So 56% of state's own revenues are actually already 
allocated or consumed or taken away by 6% of the state's family. So what happens? What is left for the remaining 94%? For the remaining 94%, only 44% is left. Whereas 6% have taken 56%. So that is where the question of equity comes in. Again, if you listen to uh, Arvind Pranagadiya, he tells you that, look, for every debate, if you want to give away something, for now, it's one thing. That in election time, you have to do, everybody does it. But if you are then causing long-term instability and long-term implications, that's a, that's a problem. For example, if all states were to go back, as Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh are saying, Punjab has promised Nam the party, they haven't yet implemented, and they are now promising it in Gujarat. Congress is promising in Gujarat and Himachal. I told you, uh, if a bad idea was buried, Somebody will exhume it and probably make it worse. So how this is being made even worse is that all the state governments are saying not only will we bring back the old pension scheme now, but we will bring it back retrospectively from 2003-2004 when Vajpayee government notified it. And remember, after Vajpayee government notified it, between 2003 and 2005, 27 Indian states 27 Indian states, that's almost all states barring two and I will tell you which two, almost all states, 27 states had adopted, adopted the new pension scheme because they say they saw sense in it because those states were already bankrupt. The two states who did not, I told you, usual suspects, West Bengal and Tamil Nadu, they did not do it. All the others did it, including Congress states and at that point, many states were being run by the Congress party. The same party is now, now going back on it. So how will the old pension scheme work if it's restored now? So once again, you calculate. You say, all right, every employee in Rajasthan now is back on old pension scheme. If you're back on old pension scheme, then presuming, say, in 2003-04, you came into the new pension scheme. You go back and start from there. On an average, say, in 30 years, you will retire, right? So if you join service at, say, average 28, at 58, 60, thereabouts, you will retire. So think of the burden it will become on the state in 2034. What this does is that for the moment it gives the state government or the payer or tomorrow, God forbid, the central government were to again uh, implement this bad idea or go back to this bad idea. For a moment, it will give you a relief. And what is that relief? That relief is that today the employee is contributing 10%. You are contributing 14% and that's how this corpus, corpus is building up. In fact, the target by the end of this financial year is 7.5 lakh crores, 7.5 trillion rupees, right? So the government then does not have to contribute now. Fantastic. Let me go shopping, right? And what do they go shopping for? They go shopping for votes. But you know what? All debt comes back and hits you. In this case, who are you taking this debt from? You are taking, taking this debt from your children and your grandchildren. So this pension liability, say for a state like Rajasthan, which is now going in this direction, will peak in 2034. In 2034, whoever is in the government will have no wherewithal to pay. How much more tax can you levy and who will pay tax? You can print more money. Maybe you can ask the center to print more money. If the center has your own party's government, they might print more money. But you can print more money. And what will happen to you? What will happen to you is exactly what's happening to Turkey right now. And maybe because we are not that rich a country to begin with, with not such a large number of taxpayers, we will then go the way of Venezuela. That kind of, of hyperinflation and bankruptcy without the oil. And those are the dangers. Now I know that today one of the one of the many bad ideas floating in the world and this is the bad idea which is supported by some very smart people, Bernie Sanders for example in the US and AOC and the other progressives of the Democratic Party. That's called modern monetary theory. That says that look, when a state, when a government controls money, it has fiat currency which means government of India, RBI, it prints rupees, it can print as much as possible. So they can just keep printing and spending, printing and spending. It doesn't matter, inflation, inflation, jo bhi hota hai. Print more money because ultimately government controls the money. Government can do what it wants. Real life may, that doesn't happen. To understand this a little bit better, I'm also sharing with you a Twitter thread. And this will run as I speak. This is a Twitter thread from Atif Mia, who's a very highly reputed globally respected 
Pakistani economist. In fact, he was in Pakistan Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, where unfortunately, very unfortunately, unfortunately for Pakistan also, he was turfed out because of his religious beliefs. He happens to be from Ahmadiyya community. Now, he's giving a twin explanation in this Twitter thread about two bad ideas. One is cryptocurrency because he says, look, the reason countries have fiat currency, that is currency issued by the government, is because you need a monetary policy, a monetary authority to then control, then to also see how they can use this currency to either drive up growth or control inflation or balance, etc., etc. This idea that you can suddenly produce a currency out of nothing, which is crypto, is nonsensical. But equally, he says, the idea on the other extreme, which is the modern monetary theory, which means just as these guys say it doesn't matter what the government prints, the other guy says the government should print as much as possible and distribute because, because you should not worry about fiscal deficit. So these ideas are the real bad ideas floating in the world right now. You will understand these better reading Atif Mia. But in this case, the pension scheme, this seems closer to the mo modern monetary theory. That listen, aap paise diye jao. Or the fact is that even if you keep on paying these guys and even if you keep on publishing more money, the fact is that only 2 to 3% of your people will ben benefit from this. So once again, if I go back to Arvind Panagadia, he says, what are you doing then? You will then pay 12 to 13% of your GDP in the long run to 2% of government servants because 2% of your population is government servants because armed forces are already on their own pension scheme, right? They are not on NPS. They are... Armed forces have their own pension scheme. So just 2% employees will take away 12 to 13% of India's GDP. Why? Are we a colony of our government employees? That's my line. That's not Arvind Panagadia's line. So he should not be blamed. Now, what, what is Arvind Panagadia's line, on the other hand, is a very smart one and, very, and, and a very wise one. He says, look, what you're doing is an intergenerational transfer. So usually... When kids, sons, daughters, sons-in-law, daughters-in-law, they need to borrow money to do anything, to buy a car, to watch a movie, uh, borrowing money from parents, you don't know what, uh, what kind of borrowing that is, uh, or, or maybe to buy a house, start a business. Usually, children borrow from their parents. In, so that's an intergenerational transfer of a kind. Or parents just give it away to children, right? Children can ask the parents. In this case, it's an intergenerational transfer in reverse, which is that parents are actually stealing from their children without their children knowing what's going on. That's how bad this idea is. And that's why Vajpayee had finished this idea. And sure enough, he lost the subsequent election. Now, the other term you have to understand after OPS, NPS, PG, implicit public pension debt, uh, intergenerational transfer is total committed expenditure. Now, what is total committed expenditure? That's again a very important thing to understand. Total committed expenditure is something that a government is committed to spending nevertheless, right? A government might say, I'll build, build a metro, I'll build 20, build 20 hospitals, a highway, or maybe I will uh, I will give a free education up to uh, class this or not just one uh, midday meal but also breakfast. That is not that is not part of the total committed expenditure. That is other expenditure and you have development expenditure etc etc. Total committed expenditure is a combination of salaries, pensions, interest payments on previous debts, and subsidies. Right. So add all of these it's already coming up to 60% of all government spending in India. 60%, 6 zero. If you add to this, again, the burden of the old pension scheme by bringing back the old pension scheme, you know how this will be. The other term you have to understand, I'm sure most of you do because almost everybody is invested in the stock, stock markets one way or the other, either directly or to stock markets. That is CAGR, that is compounded annual growth rate. Now, if you look at the compounded annual growth rate of pension of pension burden in the past 12 years leading up to 2022, and remember, these are people who, who were on old pension scheme until 2003-04 and, and have continued on because when the new scheme came, those under the old scheme were grandfathered, which is a way of saying they continued to be as they were. They were not forced to come to the new scheme. It's only the employees who joined after 2003-04 who came under the new scheme. So the burden on those 
has been growing, the CAGR on that, which is compounded annual growth rate in the 12 years between 2010 and 2022 is 34%. And you know what will happen going ahead. It's not going to get worse because our life expectancy, as I said, fortunately, is going higher and higher. And now, because, because governments are under pressure for employment, because there is so much unemployment, they are now giving out government jobs like bravery. So once again, we'll be walking ourselves into a terrible debt trap, except that this will not happen in our lifetimes. If anything, our generation will benefit from this. Our generation, I mean, people who are now elected to govern us or who will get elected in the next couple of years, they will benefit because their budget burden immediately will come down because that 14% that they deposit along with their employees' uh, contribution, that they will not, not, not have to pay now. But they would have then vacuum cleaned our children or their children and their grandchildren. That is the worry about this. Now to understand these implications better, I am also using some graphics from the State Bank of India report. Thank you State Bank of India and Swami Kanti Ghosh. So one, look at life expectancy and at birth. See how India's life expectancy has been going up over time. It's a wonderful thing. But remember, it then has an implications for pensions because the longer a person lives, longer that pension has to be paid and pension keeps going up with DA, etc, etc, etc. Number two, dependency ratio. Now that is a very crucial thing. Dependency ratio is the percentage of people who are earning as to the per percentage of people who are not earning. So basically you would say the ratio of those above 60, most of whom you can presume are retired or in any case retirees are 60 plus then those between 15 and 59 you would presume those are the people who are in the earning age so, and they will be paying, paying taxes so that the retirees or the dependent populations can be looked after. That dependency ratio over time will get worse. In fact, till 2036, it will not get so bad in India because by that time, India's young people today will all be, all be becoming adults and start earning. After 2036, it will become a disaster. It will become a disaster of the kind that India will find, that our future generations will find very difficult to handle. So what happens with governments is that they say, okay, let me go back to this old pension scheme because today it will save me money. Today I will not have to pay because my employees are young. But in the course of time, it explodes as population ages. So the state bank report also raises red flags for us. Number one, they say India's demographic profile is undergoing structural changes. One, there is declining fertility. We are producing fewer and fewer babies. Uh, that is something that WHO, Lancet, everybody has now confirmed and, and our own National Family Health Survey, which is very reliable. Number five has come out now. Our, our fertility rates are declining, which is great. Second, our longevity is rising. We are living till longer. Third, our southern states are aging. That's because southern states control their birth, birth rates much earlier than the rest. In fact, if you saw the data that just came out, tells you that a lot of the 5% of all of the population growth in the world is now coming from two states of India, that is UP and Bihar. So southern states have begun aging very fast and that will cause an imbalance. And fourth, because Hindi states will now be younger and younger because they are still producing a lot of babies, at least a lot more babies, than say the south is doing, that will also create regional imbalances. And then to understand how this will work, we have to go back and check with an aging index that Rakesh Mohan, one of our foremost economists, former deputy governor of Reserve Bank of India, former finance secretary, and today he is heading a preeminent think tank, CSCP. He, he came up with research in 2004. So that research would indicate that today, so currently, for example, those at 60 and above would be about 40%. There will be 40 of them and there will be about 100 who are say at 15, 1, 5, 15. Going ahead, this will change. So by 2036, this number will be 76 to 100. That, that's because we, will now, we are now producing fewer babies. Then by 2050, when our population is 164 crores, 32 crore Indians will be 60 plus. So by that time, by 2050, our dependency ratio will be completely unmanageable. We'll be 
we'll have too many people, older people, dependent on too few young people. Now, it's one thing for the Japanese to manage this, right? But Japanese also have lots of other economic strengths. They also started much richer. But for a country like us, with inability to tax beyond a point, this will become an impossibility. And these are things to and these are things to look at. And that's where it's very important not to do populist things now, which bring in additional burden on our future generations. Now, just to give you a little warning, a little alarm, I'd like you also to see what's happening with our states right now. If you look at our state's total committed expenditure, and we told you what that is, that is salaries, pensions, interest, subsidies, etc., etc., all states, if you look at all of India's states and look at all of their own revenues, this is minus what they get from the center, their total committed expenditure is already 125% of their total revenue. So, Amdani Athani, Kharcha Rupaya, right? Then, if you look at some of our bigger, and I would say in, a, in populist terms, more notorious states, Punjab, Kerala, West Bengal, and Andhra Pradesh, these are the four worst. In Punjab, total committed expenditure accounts for 80% of all its receipts, that is its own revenues plus what it gets from the center. Kerala, 73.9%, West Bengal, 73.7%, and Andhra Pradesh. And if you just look at state government's own revenue receipts, I told you this 80, 73.9, 73.7, 72.2 is total receipts. But state's own taxes and non-tax receipts, that is before they've got anything from the center, this total committed expenditure ranges from 149% to 191%. That's why you find our state government's universities are so poorly funded. There's hardly any research. Faculty positions are vacant, etc., etc., because the state governments have simply got no money left. So going ahead, look at that one big figure. As we, as we continue to fall into the trap of these bad ideas, today, today our dependency ratio in our country is 16%. That is the ratio of older 60 plus, 60, 60 plus people who depend on those in the age group of 15 to 59 who are earning and essentially in whose taxes are the older generations being looked after, right? That dependency ratio today is only 16, which is very healthy and very robust. And this is India's demographic strength. In 2050, this will become 60%. So anybody, anybody who's lapsing back into this nutty ideas that were buried by Mr. Vajpayee in 2003 and that were supported by the Congress party, by Dr. Manmohan Singh. In fact, the PFRDA Act, which runs these pension funds, the trust, etc., etc., that was passed by the, by the UPA in 2013. It, it, it was one of the last laws it passed and it was one of the best laws it passed. It's very tragic today. The Congress party itself is going back on it. Its governments in the states that it runs and, the gov and, and its party in the states where it's contesting. And that's why I greatly welcome the fact that one wise man in the Congress party, Praveen Chakravarti, see his tweet. He has tweeted the article quoting Armin Panagadia and he has explained why this is such a bad idea. That if you give this uh, old pension scheme in Gujarat, a very minuscule number of Gujaratis will then be able to vacuum clean basically steal from the pockets of so many others in their state.